Chapter 6 16th of March Mariupol Conditions in Mariupol were getting worse over the days. Food began getting scarce. Water was even scarcer. People had to get water from wells and carry it to their shelters in plastic containers or buckets, and everyone tried to use it very sparingly and only for essential needs, such as drinking and cooking. Showers were now a distant dream. Daniil and Lera were sitting in their shelter, feeling completely beaten by the situation. There was no electricity in the shelter for days, and hence no electric lights, no heating, no computers, no way to charge the phones, and no way to use any electrical appliances. Because they were eating very little since the invasion began, Daniil noticed that he and his sister got noticeably thinner and lost a lot of weight. His hair was getting scruffier now too, as he had no way to get a haircut and the few items of clothing they were wearing and had with them in the shelter were getting dirty with no way to be washed. Daniil, can you promise me something? Lera began when there were no other people around. What is it, Lera? When the time comes, you know, when those savage orcs get here and start killing us all, I don't want to die alone. Mom and Dad are gone. I'd like to have at least you nearby in my final moments. I will never leave your side, dear sister. Wherever one of us goes, the other will go as well. Thanks, Daniil. It's at least a small bit of comfort knowing that I won't be alone when I die. I'll do all I can to make sure we do not die, Daniil refused to accept defeat. I'll find a way for us to escape the city. A few of the people in the shelter began going topside and exiting the shelter. It seemed it was safe to go out for the time being. Daniil glanced in the direction of the exit and another supplies in the room. I think it'd be best for us to get some more water and food, he recommended. We're running low, and who knows for how long we'll be stuck here again when the shelling resumes. Lera agreed, and the two of them began preparing to go topside as well. They grabbed backpacks and a couple of large plastic containers for water and finally got out of the shelter. It was morning time, all the life all around was gradually dying more and more. There were more signs of destruction now than the last time they were out. It was overpoweringly depressing. On each street that they passed, they saw something destroyed. The city was falling apart and being erased from the face of the earth. Nobody could live anymore in many of these buildings. Daniil began imagining how much effort and money would be needed to restore the whole city. Was it even possible to restore it at all? It seemed that all the damage was irreversible and the city would never be the same as it once was. Suddenly, they heard an ear-piercing shriek of a missile in the air, followed by a vociferous fear-inducing explosion somewhere not far away. Daniil and Lera felt the shockwave and the ground shake. They had to stop and brace themselves whilst looking at the skies and checking if any more missiles were coming down. That landed very close, Lera said to her brother. Let's go and see where it hit. People might be needing help, Daniil said, and without waiting for his sister's response, he ran in the direction of the explosion that just occurred. Lera ran after her brother. Daniil had an acute feeling that something really terrible had happened just now. He was getting really anxious, expecting to see the devastation any moment now. And then, moments later he saw it. The big drama theater in the city was aflame, pillars of smoke coming from it, and people running out of it filled with terror. Daniil and Lera stopped for a moment when they saw the scene. The fires were ferocious and parts of the building were collapsing in front of their eyes. There are people trapped inside, Daniil said. Daniil, don't go in, it's dangerous. Lera already knew what her brother was thinking. I must. Daniil put the container he was carrying down, took his backpack off and ran towards one of the entrances of the burning building. The fire hadn't yet reached the lower floors and survivors were still running out of the entrance covered in dust and soot. They were all ordinary, innocent civilians with kids. They were terrified and in shock. Some were in tears, trying to find their loved ones, but to no avail. Daniel reached one of the entrances and felt clouds of smoke coming towards him, making him cough uncontrollably. He saw a few bits of rubble falling all over the place. Screams were coming from inside, but which direction were they coming from? Daniel chaotically turned in various directions, and then saw a group of people, unable to get past some of the debris, attempting to push it out of the way. 
then Neil hastily ran to them to help. The fallen debris was heavy and some of it was even burning. No matter how much Daniil tried to avoid the fires, he found himself getting his hands singed a couple of times. When the debris budged a little bit, the survivors on the other side could squeeze through and began coming out one by one. One of them stopped by Daniil's side. Don't go in there fella, it's too dangerous. Come on, we need to get out of here. Daniil wanted to see if more people needed help, but the hot smoke that filled the area was choking him and burning his eyes, so he had to give in and agree with the man's suggestion. <coughs> they ran straight for the exit along with the others before more debris collapsed all around, almost landing on their heads. Sixteenth of March, somewhere near Kherson. The door swung sharply open, snapping Taras from his inner monologue whilst he and the other prisoners were held in the small cramped room. Two Russian soldiers stood at the door gazing around at all the prisoners. You! One of them pointed at Taras. This will be a terrible day for me, but I am ready for what's to come, he thought. Taras immediately understood what this was all about. It was one of the daily beatings. Every day for the past week, the captors would randomly choose two or three prisoners, take them to another room and brutally beat them up there. And now Taras understood his turn had finally come. Taras and one other prisoner were taken out of the room before the door was slammed shut. Two of them were led through the hallway and then down a dark corridor by a group of soldiers. Three of the soldiers then separated the other prisoner and took him to one of the rooms, whilst the other three soldiers led Taras into another room. The room they led him into was small, dark and stank of dampness. Its walls were cracked and chipped everywhere and there was no furniture or other objects in it. Before he could turn around to face his captors, he felt a sudden strike to the back of the head with what seemed like the back end of a rifle. Despite the force of the strike, he didn't lose his balance and remained standing. However, a second after that, a punch came directly to his stomach, forcing him to fall to his knees. As he swung his eyes back open, trying his best to withstand the sharp pain, he saw the butt of a rifle just as it struck him square in the face. Before Taras could fully realize what had happened, he found himself already laying on his back on the filthy floor. His head was spinning and his vision was blurry. Three Russian soldiers were all standing around him and gazing down. Told you this guy isn't so hard to take down, one of the soldiers told another. He's just as pathetic as the rest of them. The next moment, the soldier began kicking and stumping Taras in the ribs and the other two followed straight after. Taras had to bring his arms closer to his chest to try and stop most of the blows from landing in his chest or stomach. His arms were pretty big and he managed to cover himself fully and get into a bowl shape, so the soldiers then began kicking him in the back. When the kicking stopped, Taras breathed out deeply, hoping they were done. One of the soldiers grabbed him by the collar and pulled him up to sit up on his knees. The enemy soldier then brought his own face close to Taras's, looking him in the eyes with disdain. You like fighting for the Nazi government, don't you? The Russian soldier asked in a scornful voice. Taras did not reply. It was no point. No matter what he said, they'd beat him anyway. So he saved his energy. As he turned his eyes towards another soldier, he saw that soldier taking a sharp step towards him and the next moment he felt a hard boot against his face. The kick knocked Taras backwards onto his back. He could taste his own blood at this point. But he refused to give up. They could beat him as much as they wanted, but they would never break his spirit. He was a survivor, and he would endure any punishment and humiliation. And when the time was right, he would make them regret ever stepping foot on Ukrainian soil. 16th of March, Kharkiv Ksenia and Vadim were driving back home from a shop. Olesya stayed at home as they didn't want her to strain herself. The last few days there was a lot of shelling in Kharkiv, and the streets were dangerous. They decided it was best to stay sheltered for the time being and at the same time to let Olesia recover before attempting to leave the city. As food at home was almost finished, Ksenia and Vadim decided to go to the shop and resupply. The choices of food were very limited in most shops and they had to settle for buying cheaper, longer lasting but also more bland food. As their car made the next turn in the road, they saw a few guards up ahead checking every car that was passing by. It appeared to be akin to a small checkpoint, 
There were several checkpoints all over the city now. But Dim wanted to turn back, but it was too late at this point as two more cars were now following behind them along the same road. Their only choice was to carry on ahead towards the checkpoint. As they got closer to the checkpoint, they saw a little scuffle happening. A driver from the car ahead was ordered by the checkpoint guards to step out of the vehicle, but after stepping out, he struck the nearest guard in the face and attempted to flee. Two other guards ran after the troublemaker and within seconds tackled him down to the ground, at which point they began to handcuff him. What was that all about? It looked really serious, Xenia wondered. He must be a saboteur, Vadim concluded, likely working for the enemy. The guards must have been made aware of who to look for and recognized him. When the situation cleared up and one of the guards led the handcuffed man away, two other guards motioned for them to come closer. Vadim brought the car a few meters forward and brought down the window. The guards wanted to check their ID and then, without any more questions, led them through. Xenia was glad that one more saboteur working for the enemy was caught, but this got her thinking that there must have been many more still operating in the city and feeding valuable information to the enemy. The enemy then used that information to bomb places in the city. It was worrying to realize that there were many such collaborators all over the city and the country as a whole. You know what Anton's dream always was? But Dim began once they fully cleared the checkpoint. He always told me how he wanted to open an animal shelter for homeless animals. He loved animals since he was a kid and had a heart of gold. And now, my son is gone. Gone forever. But Dim was getting tearful when he was saying that. It was a huge tragedy for him to lose one of his children and he was still very much struggling to accept it. He continued. First it was their mother that I lost, and now Anton. Olesia is the only one I've got left in my life. If God forbid she dies, I'll have no one else to live for. Why did their mother leave to live in Moscow? Xenia was very curious. Olesia and Anton always avoided the subject and didn't want to talk about her, saying that she abandoned them. Shortly after their mother Uliana and I divorced, she married another man. That man later moved back to Moscow and she went to live with him. She tried to get both Olesia and Anton to go with her, but they wanted to stay in Ukraine. She used to be a big part of their lives before her move, but after she left to live in Moscow, she didn't participate in their lives much anymore. She wasn't there during the big events in their lives, and so they stopped expecting anything from her. They understood that she had another life and another child to look after. That's quite a pity, Xenia commented, feeling even more sympathy for her friends than before. I always believed that both parents should be present in the lives of the children. I believe so too, Xenia. It's why I tried to do everything I could for my children. I wanted to overcompensate for the fact they had only one parent in their lives on a permanent basis. And right now, I failed Anton and almost failed Olesia too. You did the best you could for them both. I'm sure Olesia is grateful to you for everything, and Anton likely would have been too if he was still with us. Maybe. I always feel I could have done more. But I don't know. He went silent there, lost in his thoughts. Xenia did not want to press him further about the subject, as it was quite obviously a sensitive subject to him. Once back at home, they brought the bags of groceries in and began unpacking them. Olesia helped them out. Xenia told her about what they saw on the way back, how a possible conspirator was caught at a mini checkpoint right in front of them. She was impressed and wished she was there to see the scene too. Xenia could see that Olesia was feeling disdainful towards anyone siding with the aggressors and was gaining some delight from news of collaborators being caught. The sound of the air raid alarm suddenly came on outside. It startled them, but hearing distant explosions startled them even more and they realized they needed to run down to the basement to hide once again. Xenia and Vadim grabbed several of the packets of food that they bought and followed Olesia out of the apartment and down to the basement to wait for another wave of missiles to pass. 17th of March, Mariupol. Daniil and Lera were in a clinic. A nurse was doing a follow-up check on the burns Daniil received on his hands the day before. She took off the old bandages and began inspecting how the healing was going. Daniil, I hope you won't do something like this ever again, Lera told her brother. You know you could have died there. If not for me being there, almost a dozen people could have died. I understand, 
but please don't do reckless things such as this again. I need you, you know? I do know it perfectly. Sorry. I just thought I could help other people too. You saw what happened to that theater building. And you did an amazing thing to save some of those people. But please, try and not hurt yourself. I beg you. Alright, I'll try. The nurse applied some more ointment on his burns and then spoke. Your hands should heal quite soon. The burns are not deep. Just a bit swollen. But that will subside. Daniil was pleased to hear that the burns weren't serious and would heal up soon. He needed to be in top shape at a demanding time such as this. After the nurse put clean new bandages on the burns, Daniil and Lara left the clinic. A lot of people were coming into the clinic. Most were injured during shelling that had been happening on a daily basis. However, a few started coming in with infections due to drinking contaminated water. Clean water was starting to become incredibly hard to get in a city and many people were drinking unclean water out of desperation. Those orcs are slowly choking the life out of this city, Lara commented once they were out of the building. They're starving us and depriving us of water and basic necessities. There'll be no one left in the city by the time their troops actually get here. This is a cruel and awful ordeal to put someone through. A slow, agonizing and undignified death. We need to find a safe passage out of the city, Daniil responded. I'm going to spend the next few days on that task. It is our only choice, I'm afraid. You're going to be walking out and about while shelling is going on. I'll be careful, but yes, sitting in a shelter and doing nothing, that's just waiting for the death to come. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to ask around and see what I can find. Then let me help you, please. There's no need to, dear sister. I'm only going to be spending a few hours during the day, and then we'll be back in the shelter each evening. It will be easier and faster this way. <sighs> Lara sighed and did not persist. Daniil always had his ways of getting things done and by now his sister learned to trust his methods. However, this was going to be one of the hardest tasks he had ever taken upon himself, maybe even the hardest. Whether he was going to succeed or not, he wasn't sure about, but he was prepared to do anything possible to get his sister out of this hell. I hope someday soon we'll walk through beautiful parks again, Lara continued. I hope we'll watch the sunrise and the sunset, swim in the pool, and just simply enjoy the atmosphere of calm around us. This is what I dream of, Daniil, and I don't want to be alone when that time comes. I can't lose my whole family, you understand? I understand, my dear sister. I understand. 18th of March, Mikhailov. Solomia was staring in horror at the sight in front of her. One of the barracks buildings in Mikhailov was hit by Russian missiles during the night. Now, it wasn't even recognizable as a building anymore. It was just a handful of remains of destroyed walls and a massive pile of rubble, rocks, wooden planks, collapsed roof sections and lakes of dirt everywhere. It was believed that around 200 soldiers were inside when this occurred and so far nobody was found alive. The rescuers were only taking dead bodies out of the rubble. Every person who was part of the rescue team had a deeply glum expression on the face. They kept digging through the rubble, moving big stones and objects aside only to find more corpses. And yet, despite the harshness of the destruction, they continued. If at least one life survived this attack, he or she needed to be saved. Solomir arrived at the scene on her way to the hospital. After hearing the news about the attack in the morning, she decided to head there first in case there were wounded people that needed medical help. But from what she could see, so far nobody was found alive. She remained at the scene until the time for her hospital shift came. Once there were already several ambulances and other medics at the scene, she decided it was best to go to her shift. On her way to the hospital, her parents called her. They had been checking up on her regularly, especially after they heard of what happened to Timur. Solomia knew they were worried for her. She didn't want to give them any more stress than they already had, so she always tried her best not to overshare her negative emotions with them. When she reached the hospital, she wished them to stay safe and to have a good day before ending the conversation. Her main responsibility at the hospital had been to watch over Zlata during the last few days and to make sure the 10-year-old girl's condition was stable. Zlata was still unconscious all these days. Solomia was worrying about her every single day while she was looking after her. Each time she came to her shift, she hoped Zlata would be awake already. 
but each time it was the same scene. The poor little girl was injured quite severely. What will she even feel when she wakes up and notices that one of her arms is no longer there? How is she today? Vera, the senior nurse, walked into the ward and snapped Solomia from her thoughts. Still in the same state? Although at least she's stable and recovering, Solomia replied. Good. I believe she's past the worst already. You think she'll get back to her senses in a couple of days? It's hard to say how soon that will happen. But let's hope for the best. Keep up the good work, Solomia. If anything changes about her condition, let me or another colleague know. Vera left and Solomia turned back to monitor the girl's condition. She had to make regular notes of any changes or lack thereof and to make sure that the life support continued to operate properly. She kept on experiencing very strong feelings towards this little girl, wishing with every part of herself that Zlata would wake up soon and recover fully. She couldn't stand seeing children suffer so severely, and she knew that Zlata was by far not the only child to have suffered in this war. After a few minutes, she exited the room into the corridor as she needed to get a few supplies. When in the corridor, she noticed something that escaped her when she first came in that day. Lots of body bags with corpses inside were stacked in the corridors. It looked like there was no storage space for the dead, and the situation had only been getting worse over the last couple of weeks. Were there really so many people dying in the city? She knew that a lot of wounded soldiers were being brought into the hospital since the start of the invasion, including soldiers of the enemy. Pavel was the only Russian soldier she treated so far, but she knew that other nurses had to treat many others. She began wondering if the situation at the front was getting worse, and if Mikolaev would fall soon. It would be in complete contrast to the social media posts by Vitaly Kim, the governor of Mikolaev Oblast, who had been always posting encouraging announcements and making this hell seem a lot less scary than initially expected. But was all that just a way to soften the blow that would come in the near future? Or maybe things weren't as bad as they could have been? Maybe the fact that Mikolaev was still fighting back was a sign that the enemy was not unstoppable. Time would only show what would happen next. Solomia started to feel a cold sweat on her forehead from all the worrying and decided that she'd keep these thoughts as far away from herself as possible. She was not a soldier and could not do anything about the military side of things. All she could do was to make sure that people in her care would survive and recover from their injuries. 20th of March Outskirts of Kiev Two vehicles arrived in a small settlement just on the outskirts of Kiev. Oleksi and Dmitro were part of a team tasked to deliver supplies to the front line, as well as to the ordinary people living in the settlement. They said this area was liberated only a few days ago, Oleksi mentioned to Dmitro as they both got out of the supply vehicle. The enemy forces have been pushed back but not far. It's going to be very dangerous here. We'll be fine, brother. Let's just watch each other's backs. Oleksi found it surprising that his friend was not nervous at all to be all the way out here, so close to the front line. He couldn't understand if Dmitro was fully grasping the level of danger in this region or not. Two men got out of the other vehicle as well. Oleksi and Dmitro walked up to them to get instructions. One of the men was in charge and began explaining. So here's the plan. We'll need to split up. The two of you will distribute supplies in the western parts of this settlement and the two of us will do so in the eastern parts. The bags are labelled, so make sure you take the right ones. The remaining ones will have to take even closer to the front line, which is a little further north. All understood? Oleksi and Dmitro agreed to do as they were told, and began unloading the bags from the vehicles. The supplies mainly consisted of basic food and medicines, the things that ordinary people desperately needed and were short on. Once they grabbed the bags, they headed to the part of the settlement, where they were told to distribute the supplies. They had to knock on the doors and directly hand the essential supplies to the people living in each home. Oleksi was gaining a sense of satisfaction from doing this. He felt that he was doing something helpful and making a difference at an incredibly hard and depressing time for the country. Ordinary people were living through a nightmare and every little bit of help could make a difference in their lives. Every medicine delivered to a sick person or a sandwich given to a child who ate hardly anything all day. Some people's homes were damaged, but they continued staying in them, refusing to abandon what little shelter they had left, and trying to get by as best as they could. You know, if so many people here need help, 
Imagine how many more are out there in the territories that are still occupied and who are waiting patiently for help to arrive. Oleksiy spoke out loud a thought that hit him. The whole of Ukraine is crying, brother. Even people in territories that were never occupied are suffering, Dmitry responded. Yes, you are right. But when you see that people in some places aren't even getting the basic essentials, it makes you think. It's very humbling, I must say. Don't think too much, just do what you feel is best. That's what my motto has always been. Oleksiy nodded in agreement, and in the next moment they reached a fork in the road. There were houses lined up along each road that was coming off from a fork. What do you think? You take one of the streets and I take another? Oleksiy suggested. Sounds good. Let's do that and meet at the next junction. They split up. Oleksiy continued as before, knocking on the door of each house along both sides of the road and offering useful essentials to the people living there. There were a lot of homes to get through, but he was not in a rush. He wanted to make sure every person was helped. Suddenly, an ear-splitting screeching whistle of a missile was heard and followed by a bang. Then, a screech again. And another bang. The ground was shaking. The air around Oleksiy was panicking. Another screech came, followed by another bang. He turned around to its sound and saw a top part of one of the buildings in the distance beginning to crumble apart into pieces. The area was getting shelled, and it must have been happening from a somewhat short distance away, as the air raid alarm hadn't even kicked in yet. Oleksi quickly got a hold of his senses and took control of his panic. He had to get into cover immediately, or else he'd become a casualty. Two more screeches pierced his ears, and he saw two missiles flying overhead, scratching the sky and slamming into something in the distance. He didn't realize that his feet were already running, although he had no idea where. Frantically, he began looking in every direction around him, hoping to find a shelter. He didn't want to risk barging into anyone's home uninvited, but the thought began to nag him as more missiles whistled through the air above and landed somewhere not too far. A narrow alleyway. His eyes focused on a little gap between two houses. He ran into the alleyway, still carrying the bag full of supplies. It was a little bit safer inside an alleyway, but he wanted to find a way underground, or at least inside the building. He spotted a worn-down wooden door on the side of one of the buildings. He attempted to pull it, and to his surprise, it swung open without any resistance. And directly ahead, steps leading down into a cellar. Perfect. Oleksiy heard more resonant banging from missile impacts and hurried inside and down the wooden steps. The steps, however, began creaking and singing dissonant notes under his feet until a whole section of the staircase snapped and broke from under his feet. Oleksiy felt himself getting pulled down through the broken steps. As he fell, he was met by a hard ground underneath, which knocked him completely out.